In this video, I'll develop the mathematics of integration on curved space times, beginning with the basic definition in terms of differential forms. I'll also derive the divergence theorem as a consequence of Stokes' theorem. We'll start by defining differential forms. Consider an n-dimensional manifold M with coordinates x mu, where mu ranges from 1 to n. A differential form of rank P, also called a P-form, is a type 0P tensor that is totally anti-symmetric. In a coordinate basis, we can write a P-form, omega, in the following way, as a linear combination of tensor products of dx mu, where the components omega sub mu 1 through mu P are anti-symmetric under interchange of any pair of indices. That is, the components satisfy the following relations. Note that a one-form is simply a covector. The exterior product, or wedge product, of a p-form omega and a q-form theta is a p plus q-form defined as follows. The square brackets surrounding a set of indices denote anti-symmetrization. So, for example, for any type 0p tensor t, the anti-symmetric part of t has components given by this expression. If omega and theta are both one forms, then the wedge product, omega wedge theta, has components omega mu theta nu minus omega nu theta mu. If omega is a p form, then the exterior derivative of omega is a p plus 1 form d omega, defined as follows. For example, let phi denote a zero form. A zero form is just a scalar function. The exterior derivative of phi is the one form d phi, with components d phi mu equals partial mu phi. The exterior derivative of a one-form omega is a two-form d omega, with components d omega sub mu nu equals two times partial sub mu omega sub nu anti-symmetrized. Note that the partial derivative operator in the definition of the exterior derivative can be replaced by any derivative operator. For example, given a metric, partial mu can be replaced by the covariant derivative del mu. You can easily check that the extra Christoffel symbol terms contained in the covariant derivative must vanish due to the anti-symmetrization on lower indices. Finally, observe that the exterior derivative acting twice on any p-form always gives zero. This is known as the Poincaré lemma. Now, let's turn to the topic of integration. First, we define orientation. An orientation on the manifold can be defined by choosing a particular coordinate system and declaring that coordinate system to have positive orientation. In the language of three-dimensional spaces, we would call such a coordinate system right-handed. Any other coordinate system has positive orientation if it's related to the original coordinates by a transformation with a positive Jacobian determinant. Recall that if omega and theta are both one forms, then omega wedge theta is the two form with components omega mu theta nu minus omega nu theta mu. We can write this relation using the index free notation omega wedge theta equals the tensor product of omega with theta minus the tensor product of theta with omega. Now let x mu with mu ranging from 1 to n denote a positively oriented coordinate system on the n-dimensional manifold. Then dx mu is the set of one forms dx1, dx2, and so forth. Using index free notation, we have dx mu wedge dx nu equals the tensor product of dx mu with dx nu minus the tensor product of dx nu with dx mu. Note that the superscript on dx mu is simply a label used to enumerate the basis one forms. In fact, the components of the one form dx mu are delta mu nu. So index-free notation here means that we're omitting the tensor indices, which are the subscripts on the p-forms. Now extending this notation to a multiple product of basis 1 forms, where the number of 1 forms is p, we have dx mu 1 wedge product with dx mu 2 all the way up to dx mu sub p is equal to p factorial times the tensor product of dx mu 1 with dx mu 2 on up to dx mu sub p, then anti-symmetrized on all of the labels mu1 through mu p. A general p-form omega can be expanded in the coordinate basis as omega sub mu1 through mu p times 
the tensor products of dx mu1 through dx mu p, and that can also be written as 1 over p factorial times the components of omega times the wedge products of dx mu1 through dx mu p. So for an n form in particular, we have omega is just omega sub 1 through n times the wedge products of dx1 through dxn. Now let v denote an n-dimensional region or subset of the manifold m. The integral of an n-form omega over the region v is defined by the integral of the component omega sub 1 through n times dnx, where dnx is just shorthand for dx1 through dxn. So the right-hand side here is just an ordinary integral as defined in multivariable calculus. We can also define integration on a p-dimensional hypersurface sigma, that is, a p-dimensional subspace of the manifold M. Let omega denote a p-form on M. Define a p-form omega tilde on the hypersurface sigma by restricting the action of omega to vectors tangent to sigma. The hypersurface itself can be specified by the equations x mu equals some functions capital X mu of sigma, where lowercase x mu are coordinates on the manifold M, and the sigmas are coordinates on the hypersurface capital sigma. Then the components of omega tilde are given by the following expression, where partial A x mu is shorthand for the partial derivative of x mu with respect to sigma A. And now the integral of the p-form omega over the hypersurface sigma is defined as the integral of the component omega tilde sub 1 through p times dp sigma, where dp sigma is just shorthand for d sigma 1 through d sigma p. So again, the right-hand side is defined as an ordinary integral in multivariable calculus. Our next topic is volume elements and the levi civita tensor. A volume element on an n-dimensional manifold is a non-vanishing n-form, which we'll call epsilon. The volume element can be used to define the volume integral of a scalar function phi by the integral of epsilon times phi. If the manifold has a metric g mu nu, the natural volume element is the levi civita tensor defined by epsilon equals square root of absolute value of g times the wedge products of dx1 through dxn. Here, g is the determinant of the metric, and we assume the coordinates are positively oriented. The components of the levi civita tensor are plus or minus square root of absolute value of g, where the plus sign applies if mu1 through mu n is an even permutation of 1 through n, and the minus sign applies if mu1 through mu n is an odd permutation of 1 through n. If the indices mu1 through mu n are not a permutation of 1 through n, then the component is zero. Using the natural volume element, the volume integral of phi becomes the integral of dnx times the square root of absolute value of g times phi. We can raise indices on the levi civita tensor with the inverse metric. Using the properties of determinants, we find that the components are plus or minus the sine of g divided by the square root of absolute value of g, with the plus or minus sign applying if mu1 through mu n is an even or odd permutation of 1 through n. With the explicit results for the components of the levi civita tensor and its inverse, it's not difficult to show that the square of the levi civita tensor is equal to n factorial times the sine of g. It turns out that the natural volume element is the unique n form, up to a sign, that satisfies this equation. We can see this by once again using the property of determinants to show that the left-hand side equals n factorial times the component epsilon sub 1 through n squared divided by g. If we set this equal to the right-hand side, which is n factorial times the sine of g, we find that the component epsilon sub 1 through n squared is equal to the absolute value of g. It follows that apart from an overall sign, the n form epsilon must be the levi civita tensor. This result for the square of the levi civita tensor is a specific case of a more general identity, which is the following. Here, the contraction takes place over m indices. For any p-form omega, we can use the natural volume element to define an n minus p-form star omega with components 1 over p factorial times omega superscript mu1 through mu p times epsilon sub mu1 through mu n. 
the differential form star omega is called the dual of omega. Using the previous identity for the product of epsilon tensors, we can invert this definition to obtain the components of omega in terms of the components of its dual star omega. Now let's consider boundaries. Let V be an n-dimensional region or subset of the manifold M with boundary partial V. The orientation of coordinates on the boundary is defined as follows. Consider a scalar field S on V such that S equals zero on the boundary with S increasing from the interior to the exterior of V. We consider a coordinate system sigma 2 through sigma n to be positively oriented on partial V if the coordinates S sigma 2 through sigma n is a positive oriented coordinate system on M. Now choose a positively oriented coordinate system x1 through xn on V and a positively oriented coordinate system sigma 2 through sigma n on partial V. The boundary surface can be defined by x mu equals capital X mu of sigma for some functions capital X mu of the surface coordinates sigma. When the metric signature is indefinite, the normal to the boundary can be either time-like, space-like, or null. Of course, the normal might change character from time-like to space-like to null from one element of the boundary to another. Consider for now the case in which the boundary element is not null, that is, the normal to the boundary is either space-like or time-like. Let n mu denote the outward pointing unit normal to the boundary and define an n minus 1 form on the boundary by epsilon tilde sub a2 through a n equals epsilon sub mu 1 through mu n contracted on the first index mu 1 with the unit normal and contracted on the remaining indices with factors of partial a of x mu. I'll now show that epsilon tilde is the natural volume element on the boundary. That is, epsilon tilde equals square root of absolute value of h times the wedge products of d sigma 2 through d sigma n, where h is the determinant of the metric on the boundary. To begin, we define the tensor h mu nu as g mu nu minus the sine of n times n mu n nu. Here, the sine of n is just n mu n mu, so it's plus 1 if n is space-like and minus 1 if n is time-like. We can also raise indices on this definition to obtain the following result. Now the metric on the boundary, which I'll also call the surface metric, is HAB equals partial A X mu G mu nu partial B X nu. The vectors partial A X mu are all tangent to the surface, so by definition they're orthogonal to the normal N. Thus the surface metric can also be written as partial A X mu H mu nu times partial B X nu. The inverse of the surface metric is denoted H superscript AB, and it satisfies the following relation. H upper mu nu equals partial A X mu H upper AB times partial B X nu. This can be proved by showing that both sides agree when acting on any covector. Now any covector can be split into a component normal to the boundary, which is proportional to the normal N, and a tangential component that's a linear combination of covectors g mu sigma times partial c x sigma. It's not difficult to see that both sides of this result give zero when acting on the normal n. When acting on the tangent covector g mu sigma partial c x sigma, we can use the definition of h sub a b to show that both sides give partial c x nu. Now let's compute the square of epsilon tilde. Using the definition of epsilon tilde, we find the following result. Next, we can use the previous identity for the product of levi civita tensors to show that epsilon tilde squared equals n minus 1 factorial times the sine of n times the sine of g. The product sine n times sine g is just sine of h, where h is the determinant of h a b. To see this, we can construct an orthonormal basis of surface vectors from combinations of partial a x mu. Let's call this basis e mu a. Now the sign of the determinant of the surface metric is the product of the norms of the basis vectors. That is, sine of h is the product over a of e mu a g mu nu e nu a. Likewise, the vectors n mu and e mu a 
together form an orthonormal basis for V. So the product of norms is given by the sine of G equals N alpha G alpha beta N beta times the product over A of E A mu G mu nu E nu A. And from this we find that the sine of G is equal to the sine of N times the sine of H. So the square of epsilon tilde becomes N minus 1 factorial times the sine of H. Now you'll recall that the square of epsilon is N factorial times sine of G. And this relation implies that to within a sign, epsilon is the natural volume element on M. Likewise, our result for the square of epsilon tilde tells us that to within an overall sign, epsilon tilde is the natural volume element on the boundary. To fix the overall sign, we can write the definition for epsilon tilde using coordinates s, sigma 2 through sigma n on the manifold M. In these coordinates, partial a x mu is just delta mu a, and the s component of the normal vector is positive. It follows that the component epsilon tilde sub 2 through n is positive, and in turn that epsilon tilde is the natural volume element on the boundary. To summarize, we've shown that epsilon tilde defined in this way is the natural volume element on partial v. It can be written in terms of wedge products as follows, and its components are plus or minus square root of absolute value of h, where the plus sign applies if the indices are an even permutation of 2 through n, and the minus sign applies if the indices are an odd permutation. Finally, it's worthwhile to note that the definition for epsilon tilde can be inverted as follows. To verify this result, insert the definition of epsilon tilde into the right-hand side and use the relationship between h upper mu nu and the inverse surface metric h upper ab. Finally, we're ready to address Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem says that for any n minus 1 form omega, the integral over some volume v of d omega is equal to the integral over the boundary of v of omega. In terms of positively oriented coordinates x on the manifold and positively oriented coordinates sigma on the boundary, Stokes' theorem can be written in this way. Let's set this result aside for the moment. Now, if the manifold has a metric, we can rewrite Stokes' theorem in terms of the one form that's dual to omega. We'll call this one form capital W. From the definition of the dual, we have that omega sub mu 2 through mu n is equal to the sine of g times w mu 1 times epsilon sub mu 1 through mu n. The restriction of omega to the boundary is given by this result. If the normal to the boundary element is time-like or space-like, we can decompose w into some of normal and tangential parts as follows. Now, only the normal part of w contributes to the expression above. The reason is because there are only n minus 1 distinct vectors that are tangent to the boundary. But in this expression, the tangent part of w combines with the rest of the expression to give n tangent vectors of the form partial a x mu. It follows that the product of tangent vectors is symmetric under interchange of two or more mu type indices, and contraction with the antisymmetric tensor epsilon gives zero. Thus, the final result for the restriction of omega to the boundary is sine of g times sine of n times w nu times n nu times epsilon tilde, where we've used the definition of the natural volume element epsilon tilde on the boundary in terms of the natural volume element epsilon on the manifold. Next, we need to compute the exterior derivative of omega in terms of its dual, w. Using the definition of the exterior derivative and the expression for omega in terms of its dual, we find the following result. Note that the antisymmetrization excludes the index nu. Now replacing the partial derivative with a covariant derivative, and noting that the covariant derivative vanishes when acting on the levi civita tensor, we find that d omega equals n times sine of g times the covariant derivative sub mu 1 acting on w nu times epsilon sub nu mu 2 through mu n, antisymmetrized on the mu indices. Now let's compute the dual of d omega. According to the definition of the dual, star d omega is the scalar given by 1 over n factorial times d omega mu 1 through mu n times epsilon sub mu 1 through mu n. Using the result above, we find this expression for star d omega. And finally, using the identity for the product of Levi-Civita tensors, 
This simplifies to the covariant divergence of W. Now that we've found star d omega in terms of W, we can use the definition of a p-form in terms of its dual with omega replaced by d omega to show that d omega equals sine of g times the divergence of W times the volume element epsilon. We're finally ready to write Stokes' theorem in terms of elementary integrals. Combining the results shown, we have this expression, which then simplifies to this result, relating the volume integral of the divergence of the vector w to the boundary integral of the normal component of w. For completeness, let me summarize the notation. v is an n-dimensional region or subspace of the n-dimensional manifold. g is the determinant of the metric on v with coordinates x. h is the determinant of the metric on the boundary partial v with coordinates sigma. The outward pointing unit normal to the boundary is n, and sine of n is either plus 1 or minus 1 depending on whether n is space-like or time-like. This result is known as the divergence theorem. In this form, it assumes that the boundary is not null. If the boundary is null, we can't use the result that says omega tilde is equal to sine g times sine n times w nu n nu times epsilon tilde. Instead, we must return to the earlier result that says the components of omega tilde equal sine of g times w mu 1 times epsilon mu 1 through mu n times the products partial a2 x mu 2 through partial a n x mu n. This leads to a form of the divergence theorem that is always valid, whether the boundary is time-like, space-like, or null. Let's look at some examples. Stokes' theorem arises in physics in the expression of conservation laws. Let V be the region of four-dimensional spacetime shown in this figure. The boundary partial V consists of elements S1 and S2, where the outward pointing unit normal is time-like, and T, where the outward pointing unit normal is space-like. The stress-energy momentum tensor, T mu nu, is locally conserved so that del mu T mu nu equals zero. Let's assume the spacetime admits a killing vector field xi. Thus, del mu xi nu symmetrized equals zero. Then by the symmetry of the stress energy momentum tensor, we have del mu acting on t mu nu xi nu equals zero. We can integrate this equation over the spacetime region V, and then use Stokes' theorem to obtain zero equals sine n times the boundary integral of n mu t mu nu xi nu. In terms of the boundary elements S1, S2, and T, this becomes the integral over S2 equals minus the integral over S1 plus the integral over T. On S2, P mu, defined as minus T mu nu N nu, is the density of four momentum as seen by an observer who is at rest. In other words, an observer whose four velocity is the normal N. Likewise, on S1, P mu, defined as T mu nu N nu, is the density of four momentum as seen by an observer who is at rest. In other words, an observer whose four velocity is minus the normal. On the boundary element T, F mu, defined as T mu nu N nu, is the flux of four momentum in the normal direction as seen by an observer who is co-moving with the boundary. We can now write our result as minus the integral over S2 of the momentum density contracted with the killing vector field equals minus the integral over S1 of the momentum density contracted with the killing vector field plus the integral over t of the momentum flux contracted with the killing vector field. This result is about as close as you can get to a true conservation law for matter fields in curved space time. If the killing vector field C is timelike, we refer to minus p mu c mu as the energy density and minus f mu c mu as the energy flux then the result tells us that the total energy on S2 equals the total energy on S1 minus the energy that leaves the volume through the boundary element T. Note, however, that minus P mu C mu and minus F mu C mu are not the energy density and energy flux as measured locally by any particular observer. Those quantities are given by minus P mu N mu and minus F mu N mu where n mu is the observer's four velocity. We shouldn't be too surprised that our result can't be given a straightforward interpretation as energy conservation. 
Conceptually, this is because the result expresses a property of the matter fields alone and doesn't account for the energy and momentum associated with gravitational fields. Let's take a look at another example. The term Stokes theorem, as it's typically used in electrodynamics, relates the curl of a vector field integrated over a surface to the line integral of the vector field around the surface boundary. We can derive this version of Stokes' theorem by generalizing our main result to n equals 2 dimensions. Here, I've assumed the metric g mu nu on the two-dimensional space v is positive definite. Thus, the metric hab on the one-dimensional boundary partial v is positive definite, and the normal n is space-like. Recall that the vector w is dual to omega. Thus, we can write w mu equals epsilon mu nu omega nu, and Stokes' theorem becomes the following. Since the covariant derivative acting on epsilon mu nu vanishes, we can write the integrand on the left-hand side as square root of g epsilon mu nu del mu omega nu. Of course, 2 times del mu omega nu, anti-symmetrized, are the components of the exterior derivative of omega, and we can replace the covariant derivative with an ordinary derivative and write the integrand as square root g epsilon mu nu partial mu omega nu. Now consider the region V itself to be embedded in a three-dimensional space with coordinates yi. The subspace V is defined by yi equals capital YI of x, where x are the coordinates on V. Now let omega nu be given by omega i times partial nu yi for some covector omega i in the three-dimensional space, where partial nu yi is shorthand for the derivative of yi with respect to x nu. Then the integrand on the left-hand side can be written as square root g epsilon mu nu partial mu acting on omega i times partial nu yi. Note that the derivative partial mu acting on partial nu yi vanishes due to the anti-symmetry of epsilon mu nu. Thus, the integrand becomes square root g epsilon mu nu partial mu yi times partial nu yi times partial j omega i. Next, we can use our general expression for epsilon in terms of epsilon tilde to write the levi civita tensor in three-dimensional space in terms of epsilon mu nu. Here, eta i is the unit normal to the surface v. Contracting with eta, we find that eta i epsilon ijk equals partial mu yj partial nu yk times epsilon mu nu. Then the integrand on the left-hand side becomes square root g eta i epsilon ijk times partial j omega k. For the right-hand side, we can define t nu equals n mu epsilon mu nu as the dual to the normal n. This vector t is tangent to the one-dimensional boundary partial v, and you can easily check that it's unit normalized. Now the integrand on the right-hand side becomes square root h t mu partial mu yi times omega i. Note that the linear combination t mu partial mu yi is the vector in three-dimensional space that's tangent to the boundary partial v. So the integrand becomes square root h ti omega i. And putting this all together, we find that Stokes' theorem becomes the following. The left-hand side is the surface integral of the normal component of the curl of omega. The right-hand side is the line integral of omega around the boundary of the surface.